All right, so in this video, we're going to walk through an overview of the conic sections. There are four conic sections. The circle is the simplest, but then we also have the parabola, the ellipse, and the hyperbola. So we're going to start with the circle. Now, the circle is based on the idea that there is a constant distance between any point on the circle and the center. And so the radius is essentially the difference between the x position on the circle and the center and the y position on the circle and the center. And so if you square both sides of what essentially is the distance formula, you end up with this standard expression for the circle. This will simplify uh, when h and k are both zero, so when the center is the origin, to just x squared plus y squared is equal to r squared. You can think of these uh, the shift from the circle as just horizontal and vertical shifts in your problem. Now, the properties of the circle, first of all, the circle is not a function, not in any orientation or configuration that you can imagine. Um, the, there, the parabola, for instance, is a function. So when we get to that, that will be an exception. But most conics are, in fact, not functions. Um, we can solve for y, but then we would need to take either the positive or negative square root. And so we would only get half of the circle. The circle centered at the origin is symmetric in all three directions. So x-axis symmetric, y-axis symmetric, and origin symmetric. Um, any movement destroys one or more of these symmetries. And um, circles are defined by just two numbers, the center and the radius. Um, so, well, you can think of the center, of course, in space as being a pair of values, but those are the two things that define a circle. Um, if you have the center and any point on the circle itself, you can find the equation of the circle. Now, sometimes the circle is given to you not in standard form, but in general form, which is all the squares multiplied out and everything. So typically, you will see circles in the form x squared plus y squared plus maybe a x, y, and constant term. Uh, the coefficients of x and y are either 1 or they are identical to each other if they're not 1. Um, if they are not the same value on both the squared terms, then you are not dealing with a circle. Oops. All right, sorry about that. Um, so that's important when identifying a circle. Um, if you have two squared terms and the coefficients are the same, then you have a circle. Uh, assuming that, of course, everything is all real. Uh, when you when you try to find the constant and complete the square. Uh, if you get a negative value for the radius, then obviously there is no circle. But Now we're going to look at some specific examples. So here we want to find the equation of a circle with radius 5 and center at negative 3, 2. So since the radius is 5, we plug that 5 squared onto the right side of our equation. And uh, if since the center is at negative 3, 2, h is negative 3 and k is 2, so that goes in our equation. And then when we simplify a little bit, we end up with x plus 3 squared and y minus 2 squared is equal to 25. And the center, the circle, would then look something like this. Uh, we can ask ourselves about the symmetry of the equation. And as we noted before, the way that you test symmetry is you replace x with minus x or y with minus y or both. Uh, here, for x symmetry, we replace uh, y with minus y. The y's cancel out because everything is squared. Similarly, for y-axis symmetry, replace x with minus x. That cancels out because you're squaring it. And you get the original equation back. So it's both x symmetric and y symmetric. And anytime you have both symmetries, you also have origin symmetry. Another kind of problem that you might have to deal with in dealing with circles is that you may be given points on the circle and asked to find the equation of the circle. Uh, very typically, you're given endpoints of a diameter. 
Uh, if you have endpoints of the diameter, the center is the midpoint of that diameter. So here we're calculating the essentially the average of negative one and three and two and six, and we're getting a center at one, four. And then we calculate the distance either from the center to one of the endpoints of the diameter, or we can calculate the diameter and then divide by two. Uh, in this case, I'm calculating the distance here between the center and this endpoint. And so if I do that, I end up with the square root of eight. That's my radius. And therefore, into my equation, I will put radius square root of eight squared, which will just be eight, and my center at one and four. And then finally, given the general form of the circle, find the equation in standard form. Again, this is a fairly common thing to see. So you would have to complete the square here. So if we collect the x squared and x terms, the coefficient of the linear term is one. You divide that by two and square it to get the square that has to go as the constant. Um, for the four y, um, we would uh, take the four divided by two. We would square that, add so that would get us four. And so this constant, I first moved over to the other side. I've added in my one quarter, since I added a quarter here to complete that square. And I needed to add a four here in order to complete that square. And so the negative four that was there before and the four that's there now, those will cancel. And I will just be left with the one quarter. And then finally finishing writing these as squared expressions, I get x minus a half squared and y plus two squared is a quarter. Thus, the radius is a half, which is the square root of this. And the center is at one half negative two. So you get this teeny tiny little circle. Now, the second conic we're going to consider is a parabola. Now, often geometrically, the parabola is defined as the collection of points that are equidistant from a point called the focus and a line called the directrix. Um, and so from this, we can derive two equations for the parabola, uh, x minus h squared. So this is the coordinate of the vertex, uh, k, again, the other coordinate of the vertex. And a has to do with the distance between the focus and the directrix, which we'll, we'll come back to. And then the second one is this one. Now, when x is squared, this is a function. So it is upward or downward facing. And then when y is squared, this is not a function. It is opening either left or to the right. And so those are our two differences. The parabola may be a function, although it also may not be a function. The, in, the unique thing about the parabola is that one term is squared and one term is linear, and it makes it much easier to spot. In general form, where all the terms are multiplied out, that is generally the thing that you are looking for. If you have only one squared term, then that is the parabola case, and uh, the squared term indicates the orientation of the graph. If y is squared, it's a left-right orientation, and if x is squared, it's an up or down orientation. Now, the parabola is always inside the, the focus is always inside the curve of the parabola, um, so that if the graph opens up, the coordinate of the focus is k plus a, so it that's the distance between um, the vertex and the focus. But if it opens down, it's the y coordinate becomes k minus a. And similarly, if it opens left and right, then the focus, if it opens to the right, will be h plus a and h minus a if it opens to the left. The directrix is in the opposite direction of the focus, so it's always outside the curve of the, the parabola. 
uh, and it will be again in the opposite direction. So if it opens up, then you will go up to from the vertex to get the focus and you will go down from the vertex to get the line y equals k minus a for the directrix. Remember the directrix is a line. The focus is a point. And so the other uh, scenarios will have similar relationships. The axis of symmetry crosses through the vertex and the focus and is perpendicular to the directrix. The distance between the focus and the directrix is twice this value of A. Uh, if you have the center, which is the vertex, and a point on the graph, you can find the value of A by plugging the points into the equation and solving for the missing variable because the only thing left in the equation would in fact be A. All the conic sections other than the circle can be rotated in the plane, but this does not cover this, this handout, this discussion does not cover that possibility. Um, if you did see a rotated conic of any sort, you would get an X, Y term in the equation. And this type of thing is often covered in linear algebra courses as to how to identify conics that have been rotated like this. Um, the parabola is unique among the conics in that the so-called center is actually on the graph. In all the other cases, it's actually not on the graph at all. All right, so here's our first example. We want to find the equation of the parabola with a vertex at 2, 5 and a focus at 1, 5. So notice that the difference between the vertex and the focus is a distance of 1. Uh, so A is 1. And thus, um, the other thing to note here is that the focus is changing in the y direction. So if I put my point here um, at 2, 5, and my focus at 1, 5, then 2 and 5. Um, that focus being further to the left, that means that my parabola is going to open up to the left. And of course, the 4 was already in the equation to begin with. So 4 times 1 is 4. Leftward is a negative coefficient. Rightward would be a positive coefficient. The directrix would be one more unit over from uh, the center, the vertex, in the opposite direction of the focus. So the directrix is at x equals 3. Find the equation of a parabola with a vertex at negative 3, 2 and a directrix at y equals negative 4. So the distance between the y, in the y direction is 6. So 2 to negative 4 is 6. So that's the distance between the, both the vertex, uh, between the vertex and the directrix. So 3 away, 3 units away from the It, if this is the focus, then the, that six units is divided by two, and we end up that this focus is here, and then the directrix, of uh, the, the vertex itself will be three units away from that, so halfway in between them. And so this would be our center, and this would go in the graph like so. And again, the orientation, the directrix is y equals, this is a vertical line like this. Find the equation of the parabola in standard form. Okay, this is general form. So we see this is an x squared function. That means it's a function. It either opens up or down. Uh, we would have to complete the square. And then um, once we have moved, completed the square, and then we move all the other terms, the y, the, lin the linear y, and all the other constants to the other side of the equation. And then we factor out whatever the common coefficient of y is. That's going to give us our center at negative 2, 1. That's the vertex. And then the value of a is going to be 2, because this would be 4 times a. 
And then because it's negative, we know that it's gonna open down. Now, going on to the ellipse, uh, the ellipse, again, is somewhat similar to the circle in the sense that it has a similar shape. Um, but what differs about it is that they have different uh, distances in different directions. So there will be one, one direction that is longer and one direction that is shorter than the other. Um, sometimes you will see this expressed as two different versions of the ellipse equation. But really, the orientation is simply determined by whichever of these coefficients in the denominator is larger. So um, uh, if A, if the one under the X is longer, then this has the horizontal orientation. The X direction is stretched more. In the case of the uh, coefficient under the Y being longer, then this will be stretched more vertically. In general form, again, this is going to look somewhat similar to a circle, except that A and B are not equal to each other. Again, we noted in the circle case, if A and B are equal to each other, this is a circle. If they are not equal to each other, then this will be an ellipse. Um, both of these coefficients need to be the same sign as well. If they're different signs, then that's a hyperbola, which we're, we're going to be coming to. But if they're both positive and different values, that's an ellipse. Um, and again, the standard equation has the center at HK. Now, in the standard form, A represents the length of the semi-major axis. So the whole distance across is 2A. So again, think of the radius versus the diameter. Um, the diameter is twice the radius. He, in a circle, it's like saying the radius, the, the major axis and the minor axis are both the same length. Um, so this A represents the distance from the center to that furthest point on the ellipse uh, in either direction. And so if it's oriented um, in the X direction, then you'll add plus and minus A to the X coordinate of the center if it's longer in the vertical direction, then you'll add A to the K direction, to the Y coordinate. In the B, the letter B stands for the value of the semi-minor axis. So that's the shorter distance across. Uh, again, twice that value is the entire length of the minor axis. And so to get that, those endpoint values, you will, which are sometimes referred to as vertices, which can be very confusing. Um, you will take the center, and if it's oriented horizontally, you're going up and down. So it's perpendicular to the major axis. And if it's oriented vertically, then this will be in the x direction. You'll go left and right to get the minor axis. The major and minor axes are always perpendicular to each other. And for the foci, the, there is a kind of pseudo-Pythagorean relation, except that A is the longest distance. And so the equation becomes A squared plus C squared is equal to A squared, where C is the distance to the focus. And the C, the foci are always on the major axis. So whichever direction you added A to will be the same direction, the same coordinate that you add C to in order to obtain the foci. Um, no ellipse is a function, so if you're trying to graph it in your calculator, um, you'll have quite a lot of algebra to do to solve it for y, uh, or you can use a function like Desmos that can do it in implicit form. Um, again, rotations are not going to be covered uh, in this discussion. Now, in the general form of the equation, we say that a is not equal to b but they must also both be the same sign. So again, let's walk through some examples. Write the equation of the ellipse in standard form. If the center is at 3, 1, and the semi-major axis has a length of 3, the minor axis has a length of 2, and the ellipse is oriented vertically. So vertically means that the longer orientation is in the y direction. So that means a squared, 3 squared goes in the denominator, 2 squared goes in this denominator. The center 
three, one. And then we have our standard equation. Find the endpoints for each axis, the foci, and then graph the equation. So if we're graphing by hand, um, we would start from the center. And the semi-major axis is going to be uh, three units from the center in either direction. So if our center was at 3, 1, we add 3 to the y direction to get the top of the major axis. And we subtract 3 from 1 minus 3 is minus 2 to get the bottom of the major axis. Um, and then in the uh, x direction, we have a minor axis of 2. So we would go uh, 2 over from 3 to get 1, 1, and then 2 in the other direction to get 5, 1 for our minor axis. And then we would solve for the foci, solving, put our 9 here and our 2 there, solve for c, we get square root of 5. And again, that would be in the vertical orientation because of the orientation of our circle. And so then we would um, have our foci uh, along the major axis. So it would be the x coordinate would stay the same. And then the y coordinate would be 1 plus the square root of 5, and then also 1 minus the square root of 5. Again, you may have to convert these to decimals in order to plot them on your graph, but you should express them as square roots. Uh, another example, given the center of an ellipse is at negative 4, 2, and one of the major axes is at 0, 2, and one focus is at negative 1, 2, find the equation of the ellipse in standard form. So in this case, the distance uh, at the major axis is changing in the x direction. So we know it's or or oriented horizontally. And the difference here is 4. So A is 4. Um, and then the other thing that we notice is that the focus is at negative 1 relative to negative 4. So that's 3 units distance. So 3, C is 3. And then again, we put that into our a squared equals b squared plus c squared equation and obtain b is the square root of 7. And we put our center, negative 4, 2, and again, oriented horizontally. Um, 4 squared goes here, and then the square root of 7 squared goes here. And then our last ellipse example, starting with the general equation of our ellipse, we are going to need to complete the square in order to find the equation in standard form and all of the other properties. So we're going to pull out the 25 from the two x terms. And then when we complete the square, half of that squared will be add 1. Um, in this case, you pull out the 9 from the y squared terms. Half of that squared will be to add 9. Now, when we add them to the side of the equation, they're being multiplied by these coefficients. So 1 times 25, we get 25 added over here. 9 times 9, we get 81 added over here. And so we end up over here with 225. And in order to um, essentially reduce this expression, we want this to be in standard form to be a 1. So we divide everything by 225, and it turns out that 9 divided by 225 is 25, and 25 divided by 225 is 9. So this tells us that our center is at negative 1, 3. A is 5, and it's oriented vertically. And B is 3. That's the minor axis. And then from this, we can calculate that C is 4, and thus locate our foci uh, to either side of our center. And then the last one is the hyperbola. And uh, in this case, uh, the hyperbola is defined geometrically as the collection of points whose distance from two fixed points have a fixed difference. So before we had a fixed uh, con a constant, they were both the same on either side. Here, um, they have a fixed 
difference. And so we're going to get a slightly different kind of curve, again, also not a function. Um, the hyperbola is actually two curves. Um, and again, they'll be oriented opposite each other. So one half will point up, one will point down, or one will point left and one will point um, to the right. Um, this relationship generates two possible equations of the hyperbola, again, depending on its orientation. Um, if the hyperbola is called transverse y, it's because the y-axis cuts through the focus and the center and is parallel to the y-axis. Um, and so the equation actually, when it merged, when it goes through the y-axis is actually perpendicular to the y-axis as it crosses. Um, and so in this case, the y is the positive term and the x is the negative term. Um, if it opens to the left and right, we call this transverse x because this cuts through the x-axis or a line parallel to the x-axis, which will cross through the foci and the center. And in that case, x is positive and y is negative. Again, sometimes the center will be at the origin, and in which case this will simplify to x squared over a squared minus y squared over b squared. So it will be similar to the elliptic, ellipse equation, except that it's negative in between these terms and not positive. In the standard form, again, this will start out appearing similar to the ellipse, except that a and b must have opposite signs. There is no size relationship required between A and B. A can be bigger, B can be bigger. It's the sign that determines the orientation. So as we just noted, the negative sign determines the orientation of the graph. Um, you really can't tell from the general equation because what happens when you complete the square and the value of this constant could change the orientation, the apparent orientation by flipping the signs. So you really can't tell from just the general equation whether it's transverse x or transverse y. Um, like in an ellipse, c is the distance from the center to the focus, and a is the distance from the center to the vertex. However, um, as we noted, b does not have any particular relationship between to a, um, so it could be larger or smaller. Of the three constants, c is always the largest. Um, since the vertex, um, the, there's a center, the vertex is next, and then the focus is inside the curve of the hyperbolas. So the C is the largest. And so this looks more like the Pythagorean theorem equation. Um, and again, the hyperbola is often best drawn by drawing two oblique asymptote lines that the graph approaches. So the slope will be either A over B or B over A, plus or minus, depending on the orientation. Um, if it's transverse Y, then the coefficient under the Y coordinate will be in the denominator. It's always Y over X. So uh, transverse Y will have A over B and transverse X will have B over A. Again, I always think of these um, in terms of the actual slope. So if you can orient yourself, does A go this way or does A go, does A go horizontally or does A go vertically? That's always going to tell you the vertical one goes on top. The one um, that goes horizontally goes on the bottom. And then, of course, they will pass through the center. So these are just the slopes. Um, these will produce these exact lines for the two uh, oblique asymptotes. Again, hyperbolas can be rotated, but we are not going to cover that here. Um, and no complete hyperbolas are functions. If you can take one half of them, you can get a function, but that can be said for almost all conics. So here we want to graph the hyperbola y plus 1 squared over 3 minus x plus 3 squared over 16 is equal to 1. So this is a transverse y function because y is positive. Um, therefore, we know that a is the square root of 3. So that's the distance from the center to the vertices on the curve. And then um, b is 4. 
And so again, what essentially you can think about doing is if you're drawing this um, um, sort of by hand is you would essentially create a box around here. And then the asymptotes would go through the corner of that box. And if we use our a squared plus b squared equals c squared formula, we can find the uh, value to the, the distance to the focus. And the distance to the focus is larger than the distance to the vertex. And so it will be up here or down here in our orientation. And again, um, A, this is the change in the y direction. This is the change in the x direction. So our slope is A over B, plus and minus A over B. Find the equation of the hyperbola with the center at negative four, two, and a focus at one, two, and a vertex at negative one, two. Again, we need at least three points like this in order to find all the A, B, and C values. Um, so the center is at negative four, two. Um, the distance between um, the center and the vertex is five, um, or the center and the focus is five, and therefore the value um, for the center, for the A value, is the distance from the center to the vertex, which is three. And then using that uh, Pythagorean type equation, we can calculate B to be four. Um, given the orientation, uh, that it's the x coordinate that is changing when we go from the focus to the vertex versus the center. We know that the orientation is in the transverse x direction. That means x is positive here. And so a goes under here, b goes under here. And then the coordinates of our slope, remember the thing that's under y is how the y, the vertical direction is changing. So slope is change in y over change in x. So this is four over three. And then our last example, find the equation of the hyperbola in standard form, graph it. So first we have to complete the square. So we collect our X terms and we factor out the negative 12. We collect our Y terms, we factor out the 10. And we put the constant on the other side of the equation. Uh, half of this uh, squared is give me a plus one times negative 12. I add that to my other side of the equation. And then for this one, half of that squared, I get a plus four multiplied by 10. I add that to my other side of the equation and I end up with this. I need to make this a one, which means I need to divide everything by negative eight. And that's gonna flip the signs here. So X is now positive. So that I know this is actually transverse X. Now, in order to put these in fully standard form, I actually need all the coefficients in the denominator. So the numerator coefficients go into the denominator of the denominator. So these are now my a squared and b squared values. And again, they are kind of messy. We can rationalize them if we want to, but um, they're these funky values and that's fine. And then if our center is at negative one, two, then our asymptotes, again, we're gonna take the square root of these, these A's and these B's. Um, this is going to be the uh, B value divided by the A value. And when you simplify, you end up with the square root of six and the square root of five, and you end up with this expression. Now, uh, as a general overview, I've also put some problems down here. Uh, again, and I'm gonna go through them pretty quickly, um, just so, as some examples, to just to determine the type of graph it is. And you don't need to do all of the algebra or plot the thing in order to determine what kind of graph it is. So here we have two squared terms. Um, they're both positive. This is an ellipse because nine and four are not equal to each other. In this example, we have two squared terms. They're both positive and they're both the same value. 
that's a circle. Here we have only one squared term, no other squared term. So this is a, a parabola. And then this one, we have two squared terms, but the signs between them are different. So this is a hyperbola. So again, you don't need to go through all of the math just to identify the kind of problem it is. Um, now, exactly what it looks like, its orientation, uh, where the center is, things like that, you need to go through all of the math. But simply to identify the kind of conic that it is, uh, you can usually tell those just by looking at the number of squared terms and their coefficients.